I've treated hundreds of patients and trained thousands of healthcare professionals over my 15 year career. And one thing I've learned through that experience is that most people are really confused about supplements or they lack a clear strategy or plan for how to use supplements to improve their health. That's why I created Adapt Naturals. It's a supplement line designed to add back in what the modern world has squeezed out and help you feel and perform your best. Our ancestors' diets were rich in the essential vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients we need for optimal function. But today, thanks to declining soil quality, a growing toxic burden, and other challenges in the modern world, most of us are not getting enough of these critical nutrients. I formulated Adapt Naturals using the principles of evolutionary biology and modern research to fill the nutrient gaps that we face today and replicate the nutrient intakes found in an optimal ancestral diet. Our flagship offering is called the Core Plus Bundle, a daily stack of five products that gives you everything you need each day, from essential vitamins and minerals like B12, folate, magnesium, and vitamin D, to phytonutrients like bioflavonoids, carotenoids, and beta-glucans. You can also order the products in the bundle separately if that works better for your needs. The Adapt Naturals products are made from the highest quality, food-based, or bioidentical ingredients, from cellular and immune health to brain and nervous system support to blood sugar and heart health, we've got you covered. Your supplement cupboard is about to get a lot smaller. We also created an app called Core Reset to help you get your nutrition, sleep, movement, and stress management dialed in. Because no matter how good our supplements are, and they are really good, you can't supplement yourself out of a bad diet and lifestyle. The best part is that you get this app at no additional cost when you order the Core Plus bundle. Head over to adaptnaturals.com, that's A-D-A-P-T naturals.com, to learn more and start feeling and performing your best. Let's talk amino acids for a moment. On my recent episode, Why Amino Acids Are the Building Blocks of Life, I discuss why we need amino acids at all stages of life and how key on aminos can help you live a long, active, healthy life. To truly understand just how vital amino acids are for health, think about your body and what it's made of. You've probably heard before that it's made up of mostly water. What you probably haven't heard is that everything else in your body is 50% amino acids. These building blocks of life are essential for health and fitness. This is why Keon Aminos is my fundamental supplement for fitness. I drink them every day for energy, muscle, and recovery. Keon Aminos is backed by over 20 years of clinical research, has the highest quality ingredients, no fillers or junk, undergoes rigorous quality testing, and tastes amazing with all natural flavors. So if you want to naturally boost energy, build lead muscle, and enhance athletic recovery, you need to get Keon Aminos. You can now save 20% on monthly deliveries and 10% on one-time purchases. Just go to getkion.com slash Cresser. That's G-E-T-K-I-O-N dot com slash Cresser to get my fundamental supplement for fitness, Keon Aminos. Hey everyone, Chris Cresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. The latest statistics suggest that 1 in 10 Americans suffer from depression and anxiety is also extremely common both in the U.S. and in other uh, countries around the world. And there was just a recent study published, which I did a Tuesday Tip YouTube video on, which found conclusively that contrary to popular belief, depression is not caused by a simple chemical imbalance or low serotonin levels. So uh, it's really important that we expand our understanding of what contributes to depression. I've written about this for many years. We've talked about the gut-brain axis and the connection between gut health uh, and inflammation in the gut and depression. We know that nutrient deficiency can contribute, sleep deprivation, chronic stress, lack of exposure to natural light, too much exposure to artificial light at night, which disrupts our circadian rhythms. And of course, life events and circumstances and trauma, all of these things can contribute to depression. And there's another very interesting theory that's gained traction over the past several years. And one of the biggest advocates of this theory has been Dr. Christopher Palmer, who is a Harvard psychiatrist and researcher working in this field. And his theory is that depression is very often a metabolic disorder in the brain. Uh, that is the subject of this show. Dr. Palmer is going to tell us more about his research and how he came to believe that depression is a metabolic disorder of the brain and then 
you know, what we can do about that. If you are experiencing depression or you know someone who is, how we can leverage this new understanding to create better mental health. So I really enjoyed this interview. I think you will as well. Let's dive in. Dr. Christopher Palmer, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. So I'd love to just start with how you came across this idea of depression and other mental health disorders being metabolic issues in the brain. This is obviously not the standard theory of what causes mental illness. And, and perhaps we can talk a little bit about some of the problems with the conventional theories, uh, particularly the, the study Dr. Moncrief published recently. But yeah, how did you, how did you arrive at this idea? It's a great question. And I think it's, you know, in some ways, it's been a work in progress for over 25 years as an academic psychiatrist. But, but you know, it, the pivotal moment for me was in 2016, when I used the ketogenic diet to help a patient of mine with schizoaffective disorder lose weight. And that was really my only goal. I had no concept that it might help his psychotic symptoms or other symptoms. Uh, I was simply trying to help the guy lose weight. I'd been using the ketogenic diet for people with depression and other, uh, or even just low carbohydrate diets or just getting rid of junk food. I'd been using those approaches for you know, almost 20 years, I think at that point, but you know, depression is very different than schizoaffective disorder. And so this man tried the ketogenic diet. Within two weeks, not only did he begin to lose weight, but I started to notice an antidepressant effect in him. He was becoming less sedated, making better eye contact, talking a lot more. But the most astonishing thing was that at about six to eight weeks into the diet, he just spontaneously told me that his auditory hallucinations were going away. His longstanding paranoid delusions were going away. He began to realize that they weren't true and probably never had been. This man went on to lose 160 pounds and has kept it off to this day. He was able to do things that he had not been able to do since the time of his diagnosis. So he was able to go out in public and not be terrified that everybody was trying to mess with him or harm him in some way. He was able to complete a certificate program. Um, he was able to perform improv in front of a live audience. And these things would have been impossible for him prior to the diet. And so I think seeing that, seeing schizoaffective disorder, which is kind of a version of schizophrenia, go into nearly complete remission from a diet in many ways, completely upended everything that I had been taught as an academic psychiatrist. And it forced me to kind of do a deep dive into a tremendous amount of science to try to understand what just happened. Hmm. Yeah, that, that is fascinating and a powerful experience to have as a clinician. It's, of course, not evidence that looked at a large number of people, but I, I know from my own experience as a clinician, when something like that happens right in front of my eyes, it is very difficult to ignore. And yeah. it, you know, it changes everything, right? Like it sounds like it did for you. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the problems with the conventional idea of what causes depression and other mental health disorders, um, especially in light of a study that was recently published that we were chatting about before we hit the record button by Dr. Moncrief and colleagues in molecular psychiatry, I think uh, in late July. And that was an umbrella review that looked at a whole bunch of uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses and basically found no evidence to support the idea that depression is caused by low serotonin or chemical imbalance. What did you make of that? So it's really interesting because that study got a lot of press, which I think is fantastic. But as you mentioned, she was reviewing other studies and meta-analyses. And so, you know, I had long realized well over 15 years ago 
the, the chemical imbalance theory, especially the chemical imbalance theory for depression was just not true. And, you know, one of the strongest pieces of data all along has been that we know that, you know, medications like SSRIs, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, they increase serotonin levels immediately. Within 24 hours, we can measure that serotonin levels are higher, be in the synapses, exactly where we want them to be in human beings. And yet they don't improve symptoms right away. It, it can't be a chemical imbalance due to serotonin because it's increasing serotonin right away and it's not improving the symptoms of depression right away. So that doesn't make sense. You know, I think one of the biggest challenges in the mental health field is that right now, if you really get into specifics with the leading neuroscientists and psychiatrists in the world, what they will tell you is that no one knows what causes mental illness. We don't know. All we know are risk factors, or we know some of the factors involved. And we usually lump them into the biopsychosocial model. We say that there are biological things like neurotransmitters, hormones, genetics. There are psychological and social factors, things like trauma and stress, you know, throw substance abuse in there, whether you consider that a social thing or a biological thing or whatever. But all of these things come together to result in mental illness. And that model applies to all mental disorders. It's not just specific to depression or anxiety. It also applies to bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, eating disorders, all of them. And, but nobody knows how they all fit together. Nobody can make sense of it. So it's this huge, overwhelmingly complex puzzle and so most of our treatments are just based on either empirical observations. So a lot of the antipsychotic and antidepressant medications were actually discovered serendipitously. They weren't purposefully designed. And we, we saw that they kind of sort of helped reduce symptoms, at least in some people. And that was better than nothing. And that's our field right now is that is the field of psychiatry. We have psychotherapies that can be useful for some people, but again, they're not a cure-all either. And, and so we've got all of these treatments that we know are only partially effective in some people. And I think people in the mental health field and certainly people suffering from these disorders and certainly their family members are just frustrated and exasperated because nobody knows, nobody knows what to do nobody knows how to make things better. I, I completely agree. You know, I, I, this is not my field. I don't have the expertise that you do uh, by any stretch. And, and, and yet I've, I've been aware of this for 15 years as well. And it seemed to me, even with my, you know, cursory reading of the literature back then that the ev you know, evidence base had moved on that this was, you know, there, there really wasn't any compelling evidence to support this idea. And yet here we are 15 years later, and I saw in, a, I think, a news report about that study that came out that still 85 to 90 percent of the general population, if you ask them what causes depression, the answer will be chemical imbalance and low serotonin levels. So we have this gap between what, like you said, that the people who are experts in the field, like yourself and others, believe about depression and mental health disorders, and then what the general public believes. It's a pretty big gap. <laughs> Um, what's your sense of why that has persisted over over the past 20 years, despite the fact that the scientific consensus has really moved on in a lot of ways? You know, it's it's interesting because I, I think at the end of the day, it's because that's what people are being told by their prescribers. So the prescribers have it in their mind, whether it's psychiatrists, or nurse practitioners, or primary care docs, or whoever, your OBGYN who's prescribing your psychiatric medications. And these are prescribed to a lot of people, a lot of a huge percentage of our population. And prescribers have it in their mind that if somebody's depressed or anxious, the treatment is a pill. 
and they pull out the prescription pad and they want to write a prescription. The logical question from the patient is why are you giving me a pill? And they need a quick, easy answer. And the quick, easy answer is, oh, because your neurotransmitters must be imbalanced. And this pill is going to balance them for you. It, it's a nice, quick answer. It's unfortunate that it's not at all based on science. And actually, the science <laughs> has, has proved it wrong. False, yeah. The much bigger issue, like if that model was really working for the world, I I would be all for it. Like I am all for helping to reduce suffering in the world and treating illness. And if a pill can do that, I am all for it, especially if that pill doesn't come with too many side effects. The hard reality, unfortunately, is that the majority of people, well over 50% of people who seek treatment for depression or any other mental illness are not getting better with our current treatments. And if people don't believe that, I will just share a couple of quick statistics. Mental disorders are increasing in prevalence. They're not even staying the same. They are getting worse in the United States and throughout the world. And in fact, mental disorders are now the leading cause of disability in the United States and on the planet. And it's not because people aren't getting treatment, it's because our treatments fail to work for far too many people. So I am a psychiatrist. I'm not here to bash the mental health field. I'm not here to bash other psychiatrists, but we need to do a reckoning of the facts and the science and our abysmal outcomes of the current treatments. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, it, this all reminds me of a a quote I came across when I, I wrote about this, you know, I think it was 12 or 13 years ago, it was uh, Dr. Elliot Ballenstein um, said, a, a theory that is wrong is considered preferable to admitting our ignorance. <laughs> and that's, um, unfortunately, that's the history of a lot of of our theories. And, and the, you know, there's one way to look at that is that that's just science doing its thing, right? You know, like we, we're going to be ignorant a lot of the time and it's it's better to admit that than to perpetuate a theory that's not correct um just because it's convenient in in some way or another but anyways i want to talk more about you know let's go back to your story so you had this patient you put him on a ketogenic diet for a reason other than <laughs> improving his mental health but found that he had a, a, an improvement that if correct me if i'm wrong like exceeded what would usually be possible with medications in that situation, right? Like the, any of the standard care that you would give, you wouldn't expect to see that dramatic of a, of a result. So then that sets you on the path of like, how did, why, how did this happen? And what did you learn? Like what, what, what is it that you discovered in all of those years of research on the connection between metabolic health and the brain? You know, a couple of things to just highlight. So one is I started using this intervention in many other treatments, and I actually started collaborating with researchers from around the world. So we now have a whole metabolic psychiatry consortium uh, funded through philanthropy. We've got many uh, case reports. So this man was not an isolated case. We have many people who have overcome schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and chronic depression and put those, put those disorders into full and complete remission off psychiatric medications. And uh, we've got at least five controlled trials now underway. So that propelled me even more. So this man is not an outlier. This wasn't the highly unusual case. Like maybe, maybe he had some vitamin deficiency that the ketogenic diet was replacing for him, or maybe he was allergic to gluten, because those are common questions that I get. Like, did he really just have celiac disease that never got diagnosed? And so you put him on keto and that helped it. Maybe that's what it was. No, that is not what it was. So when I started 
diving into the science, I already knew the ketogenic diet is a weight loss intervention and is can be highly useful and effective for people with diabetes or insulin resistance. What I did not know at the time, actually, is that it is a 100-year-old evidence-based treatment for epilepsy. And that was really important to me as a psychiatrist because we use epilepsy treatments all the time. And so the great news about that is that we have decades of neuroscience research telling us how and why the ketogenic diet appears to stop seizures. And many of those mechanisms of action are highly relevant to people with mental disorders. So people have demonstrated that it can change neurotransmitter activity, it decreases neural inflammation, changes the gut microbiome, um, it actually changes gene expression, it does all sorts of things. But initially I was really still just dumbfounded and confused because I'm trying to understand why would one diet help people lose weight and at the same time help people who have type 2 diabetes and at the same time help some people with epilepsy and at the same time help people with depression and at the same time help some people with schizophrenia. Those are all completely different illnesses. There's no way in hell that like how do I connect these? But that was the task that I set out to do is to understand what does connect these? And at the end of the day, that led me to this broad concept that we call metabolism. And more specifically, it led me to really do a deep dive into the science of mitochondria and all of the different roles that they play in cells, but more importantly, all of the different roles they play in all of those disorders. And it turns out the ketogenic diet is a very powerful treatment to improve mitochondrial health and uh, the, the quantity of mitochondria in your cells. So I would love, to, uh, you know, I want to spend a good chunk of time talking about that because I know that's foundational to your approach and this theory. Uh, before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about some maybe defining some terms and some key differences because uh, something you just mentioned, like for me from a functional medicine you know, my functional medicine training, we, we came to see diseases as being expressions uh, of underlying dysfunction, you know, so it's like a systems-based approach where the, the dysfunction is at a deeper level, like you, the mitochondria, for example, or could be an, an, you know, cellular energy production or some other kind of underlying mechanism that can then manifest in many different ways according to that patient's unique genetics, epigenetics, diet, lifestyle, you know, so many other different characteristics. And so is that what's happening here with mental health issues as well? You have the same underlying dysfunction of the mitochondria and what's happening there, but in one person it leads to depression and another person it leads to anxiety and another person it, it could even lead to schizophrenia or, you know, a, a more serious mental health disorder. What is the connection between different mental states, different mental health disorders, and then these underlying mechanisms? Yeah. So that last part is a huge topic. So. Yeah, I'm sure we could spend many hours, but maybe just the 30,000 foot view. So the, the 30,000 foot view is, you know, the first thing that I distinguish is the difference between a mental state and a mental disorder. And Right now, the field of psychiatry does not necessarily do a good job of distinguishing those. And, and so what I mean by that, to give you some clear examples. So let's take a, a, a man who is married and has two kids. His wife and two kids are tragically killed in an automobile accident. That man is going to get clinically depressed when that happens. And in fact, if he doesn't get depressed, I think all of us would say there's something wrong with him. He's abnormal or he like, did he kill them? Like, what, like why, how can he not be depressed? So that man, if he is normal, if he's a normal human being is going to be severely depressed. According to DSM, 
he's allowed to be depressed for 13 days. If he's still depressed on day 14, he now has a brain disorder that we call major depressive disorder. And what causes that? Well, that's probably a serotonin imbalance or something, something going on there. So from day 13, he's just a normal human being going through grief. And on day 14, he's now got a brain disorder. Now, I think everybody kind of knows that defies common sense. And yet DSM and our diagnostic manual does not even tell us to even consider the possibility that this might be a normal reaction to adversity. And so instead, we take people who maybe are severely depressed in a crippling way for years or decades, who I believe really do have a brain disorder, that like, there's something wrong with their brain or body that's causing those symptoms. That's not a normal thing. But we're lumping those people with this guy on day 14. And I, I think we're missing just the common sense boat on that front. Mm -hmm. Another common sense question, you know, another common sense issue is if we went to the Ukraine right now, there would be a lot of people who would get diagnosed with a brain disorder. And we call it post-traumatic stress disorder. It doesn't matter that the country is still being bombed. It doesn't matter that their lives are still in danger. DSM doesn't take that into account. Um, it just says they've got. So I think step one is we have to distinguish between normal reactions to adversity and normal human responses from disorders. And then once we get to disorders, it's really interesting because if you look at all of the risk factors, whether it's hormonal imbalances, whether it's medications, whether it's trauma and stress, or even if it's specific genes that we have identified that confer higher levels of risk for mental disorders, they all overlap. All of the risk factors overlap essentially with all of the mental disorders. And so I am not the first, I, I'm actually just building on decades of research from other researchers who have argued based on all of this science that mental disorders all appear to share one common pathway to mental illness. But right now the field can't say what that common pathway is. And I am arguing that that common pathway is metabolism and more specifically, mitochondria. Paleo Valley's B6 are definitely one of my favorite snacks. They're unlike anything else on the market. They're made from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef and organic spices, and they are naturally fermented, which gives them this really amazing flavor. In fact, they were recently voted in Paleo Magazine as one of the top snacks of the year. One reason I love Paleo Valley is that they're committed to making the highest quality whole food products that are free of junk ingredients. They're compact and easy to take on the go, especially when I'm out in the mountains and away from civilization. Go to paleovalley.com slash Chris and use the code CRESSER15 to get 15% off. If you've listened to this show for a while, you know that I'm a super active guy. Depending on the time of year, I'm either skiing, mountain biking, hiking, backpacking, surfing, or lifting weights on most days of the week. I also live in a really dry climate at high elevation. For these reasons, I pay a lot of attention to hydration. I've learned the hard way what happens when I get dehydrated, and I know how important hydration is to overall health. But hydration isn't just about drinking water. It's about water plus electrolytes. This is where Element comes in. It's a combination of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and magnesium in easy to use individual packets that you just add right to your water bottle. And unlike most electrolyte products on the market, Element is free of sugar and artificial junk. I drink Element every day and it's made a huge difference in how I feel. Even with my training and profession, I don't think I realized how often I was dehydrated before I made Element part of my daily routine. If you'd like to try it, the folks at Element have an exclusive offer for my podcast listeners. 
You can get a free sample pack with one of each of the eight flavors Element sells when you purchase any Element product. This is perfect for anyone who wants to try all of the flavors or who wants to introduce a friend to Element. Just go to cresser.co slash Element, that's L-M-N-T, to place an order and take advantage of this offer. So what is the evidence that you came across aside from your own clinical experience, which I do value, you know, I'm not one of those people that believes that that's worthless and everything needs to be in a randomized controlled trial. But of course there are, you know, several potential lines of evidence here um, that, that we could talk about, but what was the thing that really, or set of things that really solidified this for you and made, made brought you to this belief that, that metabolic dysfunction is the, is the root cause of mental health issues. So it's interesting because in some ways, some people might think this sounds radical or new or like I'm making something up. But in fact, I'm actually not at all. All I'm doing is taking over almost two centuries of data, of research studies, um, both clinical studies, epidemiological studies, basic science studies, neuroimaging studies, genetic studies, all of it. And I'm putting it together in one coherent way. So in the 1800s, researchers in the mental health field knew that diet, people with mental disorders had much higher rates of diabetes and people with diabetes had much higher rates of mental disorders. And so it's actually not a coincidence that come the 1930s, psychiatry was using insulin coma therapy within years of insulin being discovered because the mental health field knew that there's a connection between diabetes and mental illness. So since the 1940s, we have an abundance of data showing metabolic abnormalities in the brains and bodies of people with mental illness. All those neuroimaging studies that we've been doing for decades, functional MRI, spec scans, PET scans, guess what they're measuring? They're measuring brain metabolism. So in all of these ways, it's really just kind of taking the entire body of evidence that we have in the mental health field and putting it together in a clear and coherent way. The evidence that mitochondria are involved in mental illness, that is more recent. So, you know, the first mental disorder um, implicated with mitochondrial dysfunction is autism. And that was in the 1980s. Since about 2000, numerous researchers have been studying mitochondria and mitochondrial dysfunction and their relationship with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, depression, and other chronic mental disorders. So again, in many ways, this is just taking all the evidence that we have in the entire mental health field and putting it together in one clear, coherent way. Well, it makes sense to me too, because if you look at other brain-related conditions that are not that don't manifest with changed mental state, but clearly indicate an issue with brain cognitive function or motor function, like Parkinson's, there's tons of studies on mitochondrial dysfunction being a, a root cause of, uh, of Parkinson's disease. There's studies on mitochondrial dysfunction and dementia and Alzheimer's and, and you know, virtually other, uh, most other neuro neurodegenerative conditions that I've seen. So it wouldn't make sense to me that that would be something that caused all of those types of problems in the brain, but then had nothing to do whatsoever <laughs> with, you know, changes in mental states or, or, or mental health. So even from that perspective, it seems like there's you know, probably decades of research supporting that connection. Absolutely. And, and you know, especially with the neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, you know, for people who don't know, people who have mental illness are at much higher rate, uh, at a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, some of the earliest signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease are mental symptoms, depression, personality changes, panic attacks. Once Alzheimer's disease gets underway, almost 100% of patients will have mental symptoms. So they have depression, agitation, insomnia, 40 to 50% 
will have hallucinations and delusions. And those are the hallmark symptoms of what we call schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And so you really can't talk about Alzheimer's disease without talking about mental illness and vice versa. Right. And then, of course, there's been a theory for many years that Alzheimer's is essentially type three diabetes of the brain, right? So there's a problem with how the brain processes glucose. So maybe we could get into that a little bit. Is, is the mitochondrial dysfunction happening systemic, you know, s- systemically throughout the entire body in these situations? Or is there like a, a unique problem with the brain's ability to process glucose? Like, in other words, and maybe another way of getting at this is, is it possible in this framework that somebody is lean, has normal, you know, normal glucose, normal insulin, but for whatever reason, their brain in particular has an issue processing glucose or has some issue with mitochondrial dysfunction, or is it much more, you know, sy- systemic in, in, or both? It's a great question. And the answer is that every cell in our body is unique and different from the other cells in the body. So cells are dying every day. And actually mitochondria control cell death. And uh, whether, whether it's from a heart attack because that cell isn't getting enough oxygen or whether it's uh, programmed cell death or apoptosis, mitochondria actually are controlling that process. So, you know, all of the cells are different. And we know from numerous studies, whether it's on schizophrenia or depression, or bipolar disorder, or Alzheimer's disease, that sometimes people can have metabolism problems in brain cells. And yet, if we check a finger stick blood glucose, it's normal. And what that means is that not everybody who has type 3 diabetes necessarily has insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes. So a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease, for instance, can have normal blood sugars, but researchers can measure glucose hypometabolism. So basically metabolic problems, not being able to use glucose effectively in the brain. We have the same exact types of studies that have been demonstrated in people with depression and in people with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Yeah, so that's definitely been my experience as well. Like I've had a lot of patients over the years that didn't have any obvious signs of diabetes or glucose disorders. Uh, you know, they weren't overweight. They had normal fasting glucose, normal insulin, normal post-meal glucose. And yet they were still experiencing anxiety, depression, other mental health issues, and in some cases, you know, early dementia, Alzheimer's, or Parkinson's. So it sounds like it is possible to have a defect in processing sugar and mitochondrial issues in one part of your body and not in another. So I think that's correct. So, and we actually have really good hard evidence of that. Uh, Neuroimaging studies from some colleagues of mine at, you know, Harvard Medical School, they did exactly that. They studied patients with schizophrenia, their normal siblings and normal healthy controls. And what they found is that both the patients and the siblings had insulin resistance in their brain compared to the healthy controls. So insulin resistance seemed to be a risk factor in that family, but then mitochondrial dysfunction is what pushed the people into psychosis. But I do wanna say, there's a lot more to mitochondrial dysfunction than just glucose and, and insulin and using glucose as a fuel source. So hormones can affect it, vitamin deficiencies can affect mitochondrial function, stress and trauma, the gut microbiome, inflammation. There are lots of factors that can play a role in mitochondrial function. And uh, so I don't want people to come away thinking it's all about insulin and glucose. Yeah, I think that's important to mention. I, 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 um, you know, there's a risk of being too, you know, that we were too reductionist for so many years, right? With the chemical imbalance theory. Yeah, all depression just comes down to low serotonin, which ignores all of the complexity that you mentioned earlier. And, but it is interesting that, you know, what you're saying here is not 
is that there's a unifying mechanism. It doesn't mean that all of the, that there aren't multiple different triggers of that mechanism, but you know, nutrient deficiency has lots of effects, but it causes mitochondrial dysfunction. Inflammation has lots of effects. It causes mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, chronic stress can cause mitochondrial dysfunction. Sleep deprivation can cause, so we know all of these things that we, that are well-established triggers of mental health disorders in the scientific literature. What you're, what you're saying here is that there's a shared mechanism that, uh, between all of these different things. And that then, of course, opens up new avenues for how we might address mental health disorders with this kind of framework. Absolutely. And, you know, it's really interesting because it, it aligns perfectly with the functional medicine field. And uh, it, it really does. It, it, it gets to, let's think about root causes. Let's do an analysis of everything that we can think of that might be playing a role. And let's try out some interventions to see if we can make a difference. I think, you know, as an academic psychiatrist, one of the most powerful messages of this theory is that what I'm arguing is that schizophrenia and bipolar disorder do not need to be chronic, lifelong, untreatable disorders. They should not be disabling people for life. That we can find answers once you understand the science. And although the science is complex, once you understand it and can kind of take a 30,000 foot view of it, you can actually see and understand that, wait, we can do something for this person. We should not simply be putting them on antipsychotics and calling it a day, knowing that these medications aren't going to put their illness into remission, knowing that these people are likely to be disabled for life. Instead, I think we need to be taking more of a functional medicine approach of let's look for some root cause problems for your diagnostic label and try to heal this person and return them to full health. Wow, that's that's a powerful frame shift because, you know, as you know probably better than anybody, that kind of diagnosis, like particularly with a more serious disorder like schizophrenia, is often seen as a life sentence. You know, that once you have that diagnosis and once you start on that path of taking medications and treatment, it's not commonly understood that that's something you're ever gonna not be dealing with. You know, it's it's just, and, and I would say probably people who, who know or have either suffered with those conditions themselves or who know someone in their life um, that has suffered with them don't have a lot of examples that they can point to of complete resolution where somebody did have schizophrenia, but then, you know, for two years or something, and then all, and then for the rest of their life, they, they didn't have that. So even that alone, just the possibility, the hope that those could be conditions that can be cured is pretty remarkable. It is a complete paradigm shift in many ways. And as a psychiatrist, I've seen many cases along the way of people who had psychotic symptoms for more than six months, and they went into full and complete remission and lived happily ever after off psychotropic medications. And we in the mental health field use circular logic, meaning that we say, well, that person couldn't have had schizophrenia then. Because if they had schizophrenia, it would have been a lifelong brain disorder, and they would not have gotten so much better, certainly not off medications. But the way that I view it now is that we are basically defining treatment resistance in response to our current treatments, which we know are not all that effective. We basically define treatment resistance with a label and we call it schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And, and then we basically tell people you're going to be sick for the rest of your life. And why are they gonna be sick the rest of your life? It's because our current treatments aren't working for that person. 
The problem with that approach is that we then write those people off. We, we aren't looking for root causes anymore. We think we've identified the root cause. The root cause is this thing called schizophrenia, and there's not much hope for it. Although this may sound really far-fetched, and some people may, might think that I've kind of gone off the deep end, I just want to do a reality check for people. The National Institutes of Health abandoned the DSM diagnostic labels over a decade ago. And this includes labels like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. The National Institutes of Health has acknowledged those diagnostic labels are not valid constructs. They are not valid biological constructs based on numerous amounts of research and evidence, whether it's genetic, basic science, EEGs, brain scans, um, clinical questionnaires, they are not valid constructs. So we have to wake up to that reality. You know, I think the people at the NIH are struggling because they don't know what it is. They're still kind of perplexed about it's overwhelming, it's complicated, we don't know what it is. And I'm saying, look it in the eye and see what it is. It's metabolism, it's mitochondria. And once you see that, everything fits together and makes sense. But more importantly, we can actually do something. We can help people right now, today, based on current approaches and things that are available today. It's, it's, yeah, that it is a, a huge paradigm shift and it, it is so, you know, one, one kind of analogy that I don't think is perfect, but I'd like to explore with you is um, autoimmune disease. So, you know, I frequently have patients come to me and let's say they have multiple autoimmune conditions, which is not unusual. So they might want, they might have celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and Hashimoto's. They, you know, in the conventional model, that's three different doctors, right? The gastroenterologist for celiac, the rheumatologist for, for rheumatoid arthritis, and, and the endocrinologist for Hashimoto's, and they're going to get different drug treatments, essentially, for all of those different conditions, but nobody's looking at the root cause, which underlies all of those, which is autoimmunity. You know, the body essentially attacking itself, and then asking the question, why is the body attacking, in this case, the joints, the thyroid gland, and the you know cells in the intestine it seems to me that the distinction between the mental health disorders might be even less significant there because at least in these in the three different autoimmune diseases you have evidence of different tissues being attacked and involved if even if there's a shared underlying mechanism but in the case of bipolar depression the other mental health disorders is there even that or is it just really a question of how the symptoms, how the, the, the underlying biological process manifests in terms of symptoms? Is there anything that can be seen biologically that's different between those conditions? There's not, unfortunately. <laughs> and so, wow. And it's not for a lack of looking. Yeah. So, so there's, there's been this longstanding conundrum of, you know, number one, heterogeneity. So if you have two people with the same diagnosis and we do brain scans on them, the brain scans can be very different. So one person with autism, for instance, can have a very different brain scan and blood biomarkers than another person with autism. Same for schizophrenia, same for depression, same for OCD, same for anorexia. Like people are very different from each other and that means they're unique and they come to the, and we know that. But the other challenge with mental health disorders is that all of these disorders are often comorbid. And you know, if you look at people who are getting mental health treatment, on average, they have about three and a half diagnoses. So just like you described for autoimmune disorders, like people have more than one, when it comes to mental illness, people getting treatment usually have more than one. And so the person with schizophrenia can also have anxiety or a substance use disorder or OCD. The person with anorexia can also have PTSD or a substance use disorder or other things. And so when you start to look at real people with these disorders, 
these disorders are no longer distinct entities. They overlap, they share biological factors, they share risk factors. And at the end of the day, they're really just different manifestations of similar pathological processes. Hmm. That's so fascinating. So this, you know, this begs a question. If the model of understanding what causes these disorders is wrong, then we might assume that the current treatment approaches are also not evidence-based at this point. And is it also safe to assume that the, the current treatments might actually interfere with healing or even in some cases make the situation worse? So I, just as an example, you know, there's a lot of studies that came out or a study that came out in a lot of discussion recently about how taking ibuprofen can make pain chronic. So you take ibuprofen for a short-term pain issue, it actually increases the risk that that pain can become chronic. And there's a whole you know mechanism for that, which I won't go into. PPIs you know, that people take for acid reflux can suppress stomach acid, which can increase the risk of bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, which then can actually cause reflux. So there are lots of examples of this in medicine. Are there similar parallels in mental health and the medications that are being used to treat mental health disorders? You know, that's probably going to be one of the most controversial findings of my book. And it's certainly not that there haven't been a lot of people saying this for decades. A, a lot of people have been arguing that some psychiatric treatments appear to be harmful, at least to those individuals, and that they might be keeping people ill. For the most part, mainstream psychiatry has not accepted that. Um, because we do have randomized controlled trials showing that, for instance, antipsychotic medications can reduce symptoms in enough people for the FDA to approve those medications. And as a psychiatrist, I have seen that with my own eyes. I've seen the medications reduce psychotic symptoms or manic symptoms. I've seen it. I know it happens. So I'm not here to challenge those observations because those observations are true. But I am here to, again, just do a wake-up call to the mental health field that let's look at our current treatment outcomes. Let's look at how many people are disabled by mental disorders despite getting the best treatment available? Let's look at long-term outcomes. We have a lot of room for improvement. And based on this new scientific understanding of mental disorders as metabolic disorders, this theory and the science to support it raises serious questions about some medications that we're using, because we know some of the medications that we use harm metabolism and specifically harm mitochondria and their function. So we know that the medications cause weight gain, cause diabetes, cause cardiovascular disease, cause premature mortality, at least in the elderly in elderly people. And those are all on the package insert. The FDA has mandated that those things be put on the package insert. So nobody can say Chris Palmer is making stuff up or I'm, I'm being a hypocrite or how dare I say that. Those are facts. And, but this theory calls a serious question. And I go into the science to explain how and why those medications probably do reduce symptoms in the short run, but also in the example that you gave, like with ibuprofen, how that can end up making matters worse in the long run if you stay on these medications every day, long term. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have so many examples of that. I think of antibiotics for ear infections. We know that most childhood ear infections are actually caused by viral illness rather than bacteria. And yet antibiotics are often prescribed. Unfortunately, that those antibiotics disrupt the gut microbiome, which makes then that person more susceptible to future viral illnesses and future infections. So it's this, you know, sort of vicious cycle that, that can happen. And I've seen in my practice just patients 
you know, Remeron is a drug that comes to mind that is notorious for, for weight gain. And, 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 you know, like it seems to, I've seen metabolic problems, even if they weren't present start as a result of, of using that medication. So yeah, it's not surprising to me. That's why I asked that question, but I will uh, leave folks to, to check out the book for all the details and, and the mechanisms there, because I want to finish up by talking about what this means in terms of future treatment possibilities. I mean, the, the most obvious being taking steps to improve your, your metabolic function, whether that's the ketogenic diet or just a lower carbohydrate diet or something like a paleo type of diet. That's a, you know, perhaps a pretty obvious step that, that someone could take in this direction. But what, you know, what are the other kinds of treatment pathways that your consortium is exploring as a result of this paradigm shift and new way of looking at treating mental health issues? You know, it's, it's a great question. And in my mind, this theory really unites the metabolic field with the mental health field. And I argue that these things are inseparable and that the relationship goes both ways. So if you're suffering from a mental disorder, it's not that I'm saying we should throw out all mental health treatments, that we should throw out psychotherapy, because I think psychotherapy does help some people. Um, I think some medications even can be very helpful to some people. But I want people to start thinking more about metabolic intervention. So diet, exercise, sleep regulation, stress reduction, hormones, checking hormones, checking for vitamin and nutrient deficiencies, those types of metabolic things. But likewise, I think that this theory is applicable to people who want to lose weight or who want to prevent type 2 diabetes or address their type 2 diabetes or people who want to prevent a heart attack. Because guess what? Mental symptoms or constructs influence those as well. We know loneliness, for instance, people who are lonely are more likely to die early deaths from heart attacks than people who aren't lonely. And that's a psychological or social problem, one that most people would consider mental. And what I'm arguing is that mental and metabolic are inseparable and that we need comprehensive approaches to treating human beings. We need to treat the whole person, not just one diagnosis, not just one symptom. You're speaking like a functional medicine practitioner, Chris. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, you know, you're not going to get any, any argument from me on that. And it's just always made sense to me that the things that would contribute to reduction of, of one disease state, let's say diabetes or autoimmune disease or IBS or any number of diseases are exactly those same things that are going to contribute to the reduction of another disease state because in many cases, you know, we've been spending this most of the interview talking about how mental health disorders share a common underlying dysfunction in, in, in term, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction. But of course, mitochondrial dysfunction is not going to limit itself to just causing mental health disorders. <laughs> it's going to cause, there's so many other chronic diseases that are associated with mitochondrial dysfunction from cardiovascular disease to hormone imbalances to osteoporosis. And osteo I mean, it's actually kind of hard to find a chronic disease that is not associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. So yeah, I mean, that just makes a lot of sense to me that, that those same steps that we try to take to improve our overall health are the same steps that are going to improve our metabolic function and our mental health. So yeah, hundred percent. And I, I also imagine that over time, this will lead to some interesting new approaches that we can't, we haven't even thought of yet in terms of you know sp more specific treatments for for mental health disorders. Yes, I mean one of the things that I am absolutely going to be advocating for is more research funding for the mental health field, but based on this theory and this approach. Um, because we have a lot of work to do. I mean, getting people off psychiatric medications can be extraordinarily difficult and painful and dangerous. And we need better protocols to help do that more effectively and safely and quickly. And could we, uh, could we just linger on that for a moment? Because I feel that's some responsibility because I know a lot of people are going to hear this and be really excited as they should be about exploring, you know, a different approach to dealing with their mental health disorder. 
I think in my experience, a lot of people don't understand how difficult and challenging it can be to get off psychiatric medications and how important it is to go slowly. So can you just speak to that briefly um, so that we don't have a rash of people who are you know, stopping tomorrow their psychiatric uh, medication to go on a ketogenic diet? Yeah. So, you know, in the book, I am outlining tons of strategies people can use. And I am also strongly advocating for helping people get off medications. But I can tell you, I've been a psychiatrist for 27 years. If people come off medications too fast, and certainly if they quit them cold turkey, more often than not, it is a disaster. It is a dangerous disaster. Please do not do that. I'm not saying that to try to keep you hooked on your medicine. I'm saying that because I want you to be safe. So when people come off their meds too fast, these are powerful meds that are dramatically impacting brain function, neurotransmitters, hormones, synapses, all sorts of things. And when you come off that medication, it can have, people have powerful withdrawal reactions and those need to be managed. You know, one, one way that I usually explain this to people, because a lot of times people are like, well, that can't be. Alcohol, if people drink alcohol heavily, they shouldn't necessarily just stop cold turkey either. Because guess what? You can actually seize if you do that. You can die. You can get delirium tremens. You can certainly have anxiety and the shakes and insomnia and all sorts of horrible, dangerous, life-threatening withdrawal reactions. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't come off alcohol? No, you should absolutely come off alcohol, but you need to do it in a safe way with a medical professional. And so I, I feel like psychiatric medications, if you make the decision that you wanna try to come off them, you need to look at it in a similar way that it's gonna take some time and effort and you wanna work with somebody who knows what they're doing to keep you safe and to also get you off as rapidly as possible. Yeah, and I think in my experience, the, the, the slow approach is actually faster in the long term. It's like the tortoise and the hare, right? Because when people go off too fast, they have a rebound, all hell breaks loose, then they have to get back on, and then they do this sort of bouncing back and forth. Whereas if, if you just take a slow, steady approach, you're more likely to succeed, and you probably end up at the destination you want to get to sooner than if you would have gone too quickly in the first place. So yeah, thank you for that. I just wanted to you know, put that out there because I, I know from my own experience that there's not enough awareness about, even, even amongst physicians and, and primary care doctors who don't spend all day you know, doing this, that, that how, how carefully this has to be done. And, and like you said, under the supervision of someone who really knows what they're doing in, ide in ideal circumstances. So with that in mind, um, and with the hope now for people who are listening to this that they might actually be able to get off their psychiatric medication with proper supervision and find a completely different way of addressing their mental health disorder from the bottom up, you know, from, from the root cause outward. Tell people where they can learn more about your, your book and pick up a copy if they'd like to. So there will be two websites. I've got chrispalmermd.com. That's one easy way to connect with me. Very soon, I will have a brainenergy.com website going that will have information about the book, but also information for people who want to get involved in transforming the mental health field. Um, I really want to see big changes because far too many people are suffering. Uh, those would be the easiest places to get more information and get me. Fantastic, Chris. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing this important work with everybody. Uh, I've learned a lot and I uh, really recommend the book. It's uh, a, a real paradigm shift in the understanding of mental health disorders. And more than anything, I, I think it's a message of hope and empowerment. You know, that these don't have to be conditions that are just a life sentence and that we, you know, we just are on this kind of treadmill of psychiatric medication for the rest of our lives. And, you know, there's nothing really that can be done. 
uh, which is unfortunately, I think, the current status, you know, and how, how a lot of these conditions are approached and treated. So, you know, I think your, your work and your book is going to give a lot of people hope that, that they can actually influence the course of their mental health over their lifetime. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thanks. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Keep sending your questions to chriscrosser.com slash podcast question. We'll see you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.